Hello, my name is Carolyn Atkins. I am not a native San Antonian. Um, my grandparents lived in several parts of the city, including uh, just up the street here near San Antonio San Jose, a few blocks in Woodline Lake, where we would traditionally walk down to the lake on the water and so on. And I got here as soon as I could, 45 years ago and have lived in several parts of the city, mainly the North Central Park. But my concern is for the people of the whole city. Mm -hmm. And everyone here has spoken very well to that, but I want to underline it. I happen to live out in the far Northwest. As I was driving here, I was remembering Gillette, Gillette. I used to work at the original Goodwill on the far south end of Pleasanton Road and traveled quite a distance. It was quite a ways to come from near UTSA tonight. And I went originally to the meeting hell, the site of the meeting hell nearest to me at Hardbroker last week. It was already over by a little after seven. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and not very well marked. I know it's divided in half, two portions there, but there was nothing to mark. You know, where to go? I went to both parts, you know, when I got a rich gone. Nothing to have marked it, much less. But you know, as I was sitting here reflecting on process again, I lived not far from where the park is on Blanco, where it was being doubled in width at the time. In fact, my apartment faced a few yards from where uh, the jackhammers and all the happening would carry on at 7 in the morning, there to widen it. And uh, at that time, meetings were so well. Plans were starting to be made for Harper's Park. And there were meetings held at the Jewish Community Center open for quite some time early in the process. And there were, it was well publicized, there was a lot of input, and that process was, went on. I, I went on um, nature walks and so on before the different parts of the park became manifest and realized now. Um, and uh, before it really, you know, became what we name as part of the park now. Uh, a little bit more, please. Uh, so besides the fact that the meetings were held and publicized and are incorporated into the process, one of the things that I remember reading in the Express News was how that would become kind of a counterpart for other parts of the city, a Breckenridge Park. I'm so glad we have it because, among other things, it's, it's unique, and so many of the parks in our city are like this one outside. I'm glad this one is here. They're pretty, pretty less. okay? And as someone spoke some time ago, that's something that we pray in this city, is shade, okay? To be building sidewalks and other areas, so much we need them, but without shade, it, like without livability, okay? And um, a phrase that came to me about the great long, which you referred to, okay? Um, one of the prototypes of public parks in our country is the great long concept, i.e. in Central Park. We have a unique park in Breckenridge Park, in the unique city that is San Antonio. We don't need to replicate a great long. Besides not being appropriate for our climate, Another part of that is the Great Lawn is seen as it is in Hemisphere, which I would be asked at how it's 
think of with that. Um, I used to love to go to the air between classes I taught at UNA. Uh, and I can't afford to go to Hemisphere for ten dollars in refreshments. So even for one person. Okay, so this is my hemisphere part. Um, but um, back back to um, the livability part with that. Uh, if the idea of having a great lawn as public space for entertainment or events and so forth, if that's part of the underlying purpose, I think we've got something mm -hmm. already included in the master plan of doing some of the necessary restoration over at, um, I'm sorry, Sunken Gardens. Thank you, Sunken Gardens. And for so long, Sunken Gardens and the Japanese Tea Garden just was in total degradation. Not in decline, but in degradation until some citizens begin to take that on. And so that's where I'd like to see the emphasis go with parks and recreation, is whether it's down where the river is putrid, just out, uh, or adjacent to River Road, and it's become putrid for lack of, of uh, attention, or uh, along the way, um uh, environment which has been used well in the past and can be again. And why would we need a great shadeless lawn then? And I certainly underline the parts about accessibility. Physical accessibility and community accessibility. Both things have been work. Stewardship stewardship so that long after these improvements are made, it's cared for on a consistent basis. Not just looked at as how can we most efficiently do it. And that this become an environment for all. Battles are um, my main points uh, that this be truly for all of us. And um, not something that gets kind of uh, put aside as partially done or something that people for generations are left out. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Guadalupe <laughs> Lopez, followed by Tony Villanueva. I am Guadalupe Lopez. I'm a resident of City Council District 4, County Precinct 1. And I don't remember my school district. I think it's 5. What I want to, uh, I guess, uh, think about is the historical importance, how critical it is for the life of our city, the life of our citizens to realize, of course, that we hold our lives to the Carter Ward sisters, because they gave their life for our life. But also the contribution of, of George Brackenridge, a wise man that learned how to capitalize on that water hose, and we're still paying for it. And if we mess up, and I think we have, because we see the conflict that was between the River, River uh, Neighborhood Association with a project on uh, Hildebrand, those citizens paid a price to voice their concern and their loss. But why? Because there's always outsiders, and you know, I'm not against progress. I'm not the person that you know, things should be because that's the way they've always been. There has to be some progress, but not at the detriment of our interests, of our needs. We are the taxpayers. 
And I think the big question remains, as it has been stated over and over, who owns the park? And I think Mr. Brackenridge said that the citizens of San Antonio own the park. And it, uh, it, uh, I was wondering, is there a copy of, of his testament, of his statement, mm -hmm. in uh, giving us that land? Yeah. Is yes. there, or now, are we uh, honoring that uh, request? I was an educator for 30 years, well, I still am. And I remember one of the highlights of our year was when we could take the little ones to Brackenridge Park. Not only to the zoo, so they could be able to see, touch, and smell and God's creation, all the creatures, but also the freedom, enjoying free and open space, because we would go there but also the valuable assets that are there. The Chinese garden, the contribution that they've given our, our society. The Urrutia, Urrutia estate. Do you realize how important it is for our children to know what contribution the Urrutias <coughs> made to our history? You know, they wonder that we knew how to read and write. We had scholars, we had people of of uh, greatness that came to build our city. And the Olympia State is there. I think only uh, uh, some couple of bricks or so, but uh, probably that's gonna be gone too. And again, the question is, you know, why are we being treated like we are a group of people that need to be a colony of indigenous people. Somebody tells us, this is what you need. We know this is what you need, so you need to want it. Oh, by the way, you have to pay for it too. You know, we're what, uh, I think, considered one of the 46% that never pay taxes, and heck, I've never met a single one yet that doesn't pay taxes. I haven't met a soul yet. I think even my daughter does also who pay the, the tax. Again, we don't need to be told this is what we need. We know what we need. And this land, because we pay for it over and over and over again. Look at my tax statement. I do pay taxes, even though 46% of the thing. But the final com comment is, you know, these people that think they know what we want and what we need and what is best for us are very wrong. I know developers have an exuberant power over our elected officials and our, and our system, and it's silly for us to deny that. And talking about the, the, the war, and look what happened to Berryman and Sauce. How many times a day do we not suffer the same things that Berryman was accused of? Sexual abuse, corruption, cor uh, dirtying our water with the sewer, and on and on. But the National Guard doesn't come and, and resolve the problem. And my last statement is, I will repeat what Donald Trump and Senator said. This damn system is rigged. <laughs> Thank you. Tony, Tony Villanueva, followed by Alfonso de Leon. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Tony Villanova, and I am a, a professor at Palo Alto College nearby. Uh, a couple of minutes, actually, four minutes away. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Councilman Saldana for being here. I appreciate that he uh, has been here throughout the evening, and that's very good that he's listening to you. I think a lot of very good statements have been made. Um, and you know, I'm holding classes this summer. Uh, found out about the renovation, so I asked my students, have you been to the park? And everybody said, sure, mm -hmm. we've been there. I asked them, do you know about the renovation? What renovation? I bet if we ask all the students, they're going to say the same thing. What renovation? I encourage them to be here. 
they have families and they have kids, it's going to be hard for them to show up. I mean, we should take another meeting to the college, another one at Brackenridge. I mean, we really want to put everywhere. Uh, I don't think this represents everybody. I think one person can represent a lot of people, but there's a lot more than can be heard. Uh, you mentioned several times uh, park use will not change. Um, I, I think that's a hypothetical. And if changes that you make is going to affect park use. So I, you need to clarify what you mean by park use will not change. I think it will change. I don't know that we've done any studies to say definitively that it will not change. I mean, we're going to significant as soon as you change the, you know, restrict the uh, entrance, the number of entrances, of course, it's going to affect park use. Uh, number three, uh, my third point, uh, <coughs> what's wrong with multiple access points? Now, yeah, I, I never thought that was a problem. Uh, not an issue. I heard it was for common park entrance theme and for branding, rebranding. I'm not sure who came up with this idea that it needs to be rebranded. Most of us who lived here for many years know that the park is there. It doesn't need rebranding. It, it is an icon. I mean, we know how to get there. <laughs> so, again, I mean, who came up with it? And who came up with the five strategies? I'm just curious because I'm reading each one and I'm thinking, well, you know, when you teach, you have to use question all the assumptions. Like, who came up with the five strategies? Because they're all based on assumptions and I'm not sure those assumptions are valid. <laughs> we need to go back to the five strategies and see if they're even valid. Increase visibility and pedestrian access. But what are the numbers that say we need to increase it? What is the flow of it? All the data that the common citizen needs to have to be able to make good judgment. I mean, I think a few people have access to this, but we don't. So we're just supposed to trust that these five uh, strategies is what's needed. So really, in the spirit of transparency, give us the information that you have <laughs> to question these assumptions and make sure that they're valid. There's a statement, um, there will be no fees assessed. I think you've heard this uh, statement many times. Nothing is free. <laughs> it won't be free. There will be fees assessed. They're just going to come in the form of tax increases, municipal bonds. We'll pay for it one way or the other. I mean, we will. So there will be fees. They just won't be immediate. And we're all going to pay for it. So my recommendation is, like everybody has been saying this, and I hope really that you really listen to the strongest recommendations being made, I think. Start over. I mean, it was off on the wrong foot. This time he includes the people who used the park from the beginning. Not now, you know, we've got a, a 250, we've got a nice plan. <laughs> We should have included the people before the plan. You know, like, what do you think? Having surveys, asking the community, what do you can think before we even begin to talk about it? Process has been mentioned a lot. Respect the process is what I have here. If you violate the process, you violate the trust. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Let's respect the process, respect trust, and respect. Charge to put a hotel inside the park. 
Uh, I want to tell you what I've been talking to people about, because we're running a campaign against it. It's called Hands Off Our Car. So, this is what I tell people. I said, have you heard what's happening at Henry Square Park? Guess what people say? No. no. Just like with Bracken Park. Parks. So I tell them, I said, are you aware that the city is going to use your taxpayer money to put a hotel inside that park? Guess what they say? Of course not. They don't know. So the city sort of found a loophole in the system to bypass an election. Because usually when, in Texas, when a city wants to exchange land with a, with a private company, there needs to be some kind of election. Well, that didn't happen. Luckily for you people who are uh, strong community leaders of Brackenridge Park, you know, brought this to the people's attention. But Hemisphere Park is, once they put that hotel there, it's no longer a park. How can you say it's a park when you see a hotel inside of it? You can't. It's not a park anymore. So, on August the 3rd, I believe, so we're going to have a rally down at City Hall. So we invite everyone to come. We have flyers. But I just want to let you know that you haven't lost Brackenridge Park yet. But you're getting ready to lose Hemisphere Park. Thanks to Councilman Trino. Thank you. So that concludes the portion of citizens signed up to speak. Is there anybody that I missed? Or are you signing in? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Councilman uh, Trevino is chair. We have uh, District 6, Councilman Ray Lopez. Uh, District 7, Councilman um, Chris Medina. District 2, Councilman Warwick. Did I miss them all? Did I get them all? Councilman Saldana. Those. Yeah, so once we provide the update, the answer is yes. And once the, we provide the update, we will receive direction from them on how parks need to proceed in, in next steps of this process. So again, the meeting's in August, and it'll be by that point, our project team will combine all the data that we've accumulated over the six meetings, comment cards, comments, emails, surveys, dots on boards, everything. The purpose of that meeting is to provide exactly the, share with them what the strategies were, here was the comments and, and public feedback on each, and then receive direction at that time. But that, that's a long version of yes. Is it open to the public? Yes. At what time? The, right now it is, um, has it been set yet? 2, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. We work. And we work. Can, you, can it be changed to an evening? Okay, so um, Councilman Trevino is here, Councilman Sedan is here. We'll take back that feedback and evaluate how we can again um, make information available to the public and the Parks Department. The Department is committed to doing additional public meetings and Council will be invited to attend to provide and report back the same information that the uh, uh, Neighborhoods and Livability Committee will receive in August. So we're basically be providing that information to them and then the public. What day is that? August 15th. I'd like to make a comment to Councilman Swift. The title of that wanted to speak on the Breckenridge Park Master Plan. Okay, um, so that concludes the portion of, of citizens signed up to speak. I do want to acknowledge uh, Pearl D. Cruz. She is with uh, Senator Jose Menendez's office. 
in uh, District 26. I'm going to thank you for being here and his office being engaged through these meetings. I know you've been to other meetings as well. And I also want to welcome up Councilman Saldana. So if you want to offer some closing remarks to the, the group, sure. please. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I wanted to just uh, say, stand up here and say thank you to a few folks. Uh, let me start by saying thank you to the city staff. I know that they've taken some time into this that uh, they wouldn't otherwise. And, and for that, I want to also thank the, the reason we're here, which is the community members who, who asked for this. Uh, welcome to uh, Ramirez Park. This is actually my neighborhood park. I grew up down the street here. This is where I used to practice basketball at 10 or 11 years old. We need Wi-Fi. And I, I know that <laughs> Susanna's got to be working on Wi-Fi. Uh, so there's things that we still need to work on here. The, the issue is that this park is open to not just District 4 residents or those people like me who live two minutes away from here. This is open to many folks uh, because our, our parks don't take boundary lines and they don't ask where you're from, do you live in the district, which is the same case for Brackenwood. And I just want to say that, that change happens very often in this city. The question is whether there were, we're actually getting the input of people about that change and if we're leaving people behind when things are changing around them. Sometimes we just are spectators to something that pops up or something that is, uh, uh, surfaces, in this case, a plan about changing Brackenridge. And I've said something before that I think is worth repeating and I have to actually ask myself whether I always believe it to be true because we've proven so many times in our city's history that sometimes it's not always true, which is that it's not about the people in power, it's about the power of the people. Well, sometimes it is about the folks who are in positions of power who are making decisions without the input of the community. And I have no doubt that what would have happened is the city council would have gotten a plan, and sometimes, whether we're making changes or not, and we're leaving people out, sometimes it is intentional, there have been cases in this city's history that we know well where folks' opinion has been let out, been, been left out. And sometimes it happens unintentionally, where folks truly want to see something happen. And nobody here in this room is opposed to improvements at Brackenridge Park. But what they are opposed to is having those improvements made without a community voice and community's input. And, and I'm glad to see that you all are here. I'm here to thank you all because uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. It's a full contact sport. And we're getting people who are here who are actually involved in using your voice because I have no doubt about this, that I do not raise this as an issue, that we should be talking about Brackenridge not just in one district but the entire city because I know I have folks down on the south side who use Brackenridge for a number of different occasions, not just on holidays. Um, they care about this. And you've surfaced this level of conversation that now we're getting more input because it would have been one direction. It would have been change happening to you and not change with you. And so uh, I'm glad that we're at least having this conversation. I want to thank you all, specific folks that I'm looking at, who I know are part of making sure that you get people here to talk about this, uh, because it's important that we get your input, and this is not just change for the sake of change without your input, because we've seen that happen too often in the city, and I've seen that even happen in the five years that I've been on council. Uh, so I want to make sure that you, you are acknowledged uh, and that you are getting credit for coming forward. And I want to thank Councilman Trevino, because uh, he was the first on some of those emails to say, hey, this is something we need to actually consider doing and bringing out to the community. Uh, he did not hesitate, he brought us all in and said, that this is not just something that's in my district and around my district, we need to bring everybody around. And now, because of that, we're having a uh, community meeting right here in my backyard, and there are folks from the south side, folks from the north side who come to visit, uh, because these parks are for everyone, and we all pay it into them, so we all should have a voice into what they look like in the future. So, nothing is set in stone, it has to come to the city council. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's on this plan that needs to be on there. There's also nothing on this plan that might not find its way, but not without your input. Uh, we're the final say, uh, because at the end of the day, they need funding from the city council, and they need to vote from the city council. So uh, I carry your words with a lot of weight, and so I want to thank you all for coming out here tonight. And that's the only comment I want to make, say thank you to Dr. Maria, Jessica, uh, Susana, and the folks who are here as part of the community groups, uh, Mission Democrats, and so thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Just for the